um, this equipment to see if it works. Uh, if you can see me and not just hear me, you can see T.D. Jakes in the back. I'll, I'll watch that in the morning to get my head right, get my spirit right. Because um, these, you know, these devils will be after you. So I'm opening my phone right now um, to start off with a preface to this podcast. And so each night, morning, I listen to my writings because I'm working on a book. Frontier in American History, 1900 to 1930. Timothy Eugene Nelson. Preface. Black Dawn was a real place. I have to make this fact clear because my brother Maison Nelson thought I made it up. No lie. Maison, pronounced Maison, recorded my doctoral graduation. He flew all the way from the Air Force Base, where he was stationed in Las Vegas, Nevada, to El Paso, Texas. He took pictures with me holding my University of Texas at El Paso mock diploma. Still, after not seeing him for about five years, his question was, when you gone make some money? I graduated with a Ph.D. in Borderland History on December 10, 2015, with subfield expertise in African Diasporic Studies and U.S. History. In 2019, I accepted a seat on a panel at the National Conference for the Western History Association in Las Vegas, Nevada, at the Westgate Vegas Resort and Casino, near the Vegas Strip. Dr. Kenneth Hamilton was on the panel, and I could not pass up the chance to meet him in person. Unknown to Dr. Hamilton, he had become an intellectual father to the Black Dawn thesis, an all-around icon for me. Maison drove from his house on the north side of Vegas. At first sight, when you gone make some money. Forgive me for belaboring the point, but Black Dawn was a real place. Audible to the people sitting around Maison in the conference room of my panel, he said, oh, I thought he made that up. Table of contents. Preface. So, um, I still don't know why my brother thought I made it up or how he didn't figure out that I didn't make it up. He went to my graduation. He took pictures. He he spoke to my um, d- uh, um, dissertation chair. Um, and he he's even in the video that I show at the end of this broadcast. Um... <laughs> He's screaming in the video. So if he thought I made it up and it being blacked him or I, I think that's what he was talking about. I assume he's talking about blacked him. I can't imagine blacked him being made up. But anyway, um, it's why I begin all of my presentations with blacked him was a real place because we're beginning um, a new era where you can't assume people know anything about what you're talking about because there's so much information and so little being given in school. Um, So Blackdom was a real place. And it, it came from an inherited idea that idea of of sovereignty, of liberation. Um, It comes from uh, the 1700s. You know, Prince Hall, Prince Hall Freemasonry uh, began in the, I mean, I could Google it, but (laughs) like 1780s, I think. And... It was also synchronized with um, the AME Church. I assume, I assume J- T- uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes is a part of
force field. They are the ozone layer of the whole uh, Afro frontier because violence. I mean, you, you have to meet violence with violence in frontier spaces. So it's best to have a protection force. So you have the spiritual the black military and so those three consciousnesses those three institutions those three a small town once lived here in the wide open spaces of opportunity intersectional blackness um While Blackdom was a real place, the condition of blackness. So when you say, or when I say I'm black, it's because I live under a condition of blackness created by this. You can call it capitalism. You can call it white supremacy. It doesn't matter. The consequence is that I am black. And I just got a, your device will restart to update outside the app. Okay. All right. So I thought my computer's about to start updating. Okay. Where was I? Um, intersectional blackness. We'll talk a lot about this later as the um, Blackdom Renaissance podcast goes on. Um, I want you now to give me a moment while I cue this video. I'm getting used to this equipment. Um, and I want to introduce you to uh, how this all started. V. Ataraxia Project or Project. The Doniana County Sheriff's Department developed a law enforcement use of force class for the community. After seeing that many were unaware what was proper procedure for using force. There's tons of misconceptions out there. Unfortunately, a lot of people get the information from not allowed to force it, you know, climbing in Hollywood. The Ataraxia Project. Um, so, um, in my during my PhD time, or my time as a doctoral student, and it was t it was a whole decade. Um, I realized there was no place for me in academia. Or no, let me say, let me let me say let me let me not say that because I don't want to you know curse myself, but. Uh, I knew that academia wasn't going to be, wasn't easily going to be um, um, a place where uh, that was accepting of my work. Is that fair? I guess so. Um, so I started my own institution. It's not really about him, but just you two, the power of social media. How you doing? Tremendous. How you doing? I'm good. 
the reason why I'm stopping is you got that thing attached to the leash on the pants. Oh, my bad. So when you get stopped by the police, you got to pull them right away. Okay. Uh, all right, all right, all right. About so what do you need? See your license. Okay. Where you from? Uh, I'm, where am I from? I'm from California. Okay. So since you're not from Arizona, I'm just going to give you a warning, okay? Okay. You can't have anything. You can't have anything attached to the windshield below. So I'm just... Just now we're gonna. Thing is mounted right there. Yeah. Oh you can have it mounted up here. It's not in your view. Okay. All right. Okay. And no so, big deals, right? You want to get you here, right? Okay. All right. So. so we want to have that. They have. Uh, Intersectional blackness. Okay. So I'll just go back there. Intersectional blackness um, is is not a definable term. It it happens when it happens. It happens when you get um people who are conscious of the condition and meeting that condition with a unification so it's like a, so it's a it's a, so it's a space created by the condition but by the people who are under the condition and 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 I don't know if necessarily you have to do something about that condition but you're united because of that one so it could be anything from um um cowboys Black cowboys in the frontier. Well, that space is created by black folks who have to then go through a process of becoming. Or they're born there, depending on which story you're talking about. So blackness is the condition on top of the living. So um, that doesn't really define it. And I'm not trying to define it as much now because I'd like more of a discussion about intersectional blackness but um, that's where you get uh, the core of the black thesis um, and the point of the black renaissance podcast it is a resurrection of the intersection between ministers military men and black freemasons why those three um and why seemingly all male um, there are for for Prince Hall Freemasonry there are auxiliary groups that include women um, um, the Negro Order of the Eastern Star I believe is the um, auxiliary group that um, Ella Boyer for example for example was was a part of and Frank Boyer was a um, Prince Hall Freemason. He was the, and I can look it up. I just, I, I don't really keep all these things in my head. If, if there's a book, <laughs> I could look at it. But other than that, I, I don't want to bother myself with all those small but important facts. Um, because I could Google it, right? My phone is in front of me. Um. So yeah, the the so the, so. In so that triad, that revolutionary triad of ministers, military men, and black Freemasons came to New Mexico and colonized black colonizers. Are you ready to discuss how black people colonized? We talk colonizer decolonization um but what do you do when you are a brownish person under a black condition right brownish person from the physical look What do you do? Recipient of the Doctor of Philosophy degree in Borderlands History, Timothy E. Nelson, will be hooded by Dr. Jeffrey Shepard. In memoriam, Dr. Basio Crenshaw Daly, the Dean of the House of Liberal Arts, Dr. Patricia
All right. Testing. Okay, take one. Blackdom. The significance of the Afro frontier in American history, 1900 to 1930. Timothy Eugene Nelson. Preface. Blackdom was a real place. I have to make this fact clear because my brother Mason Nelson thought I made it up. No lie. Um, my brother thought I made it up. So as I'm testing, I'm testing. Um, all of the recording equipment and um, and I'm going to start off by talking about my brother thought I made it So much history has been left behind, and a lot of us don't know that history, so I have to catch us up. So I began all the way in the 1700s, but really, this is a 1519 project. You heard it here first. It's a 1519 project, going back to... Juan Garrido, who settled in Mexico, he he was his 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 birth name wasn't Juan um, because he was born in um, West Africa or no Congo, something to that effect, as a Muslim. Excuse me, as a follower of Islam. Um, he then went to Portugal, where he, that's where he became Juan in the late 14, 1490s, like, you know, around Columbus, 1492, around that time. And then um, he hitched to ride a boat, and then he helped to um, seize um what is now known as Puerto Rico and Cuba I think he was in on that and Tenochtitlan <laughs> I don't know if I said that one right but y'all who know what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about uh I'm going to work on my language too while I'm while I'm in front of this mic um so yeah Juan he Juan, he was, um, he finally retired from his military service and genocidal campaigns against indigenous peoples on what we call now the North American continent and South America, but just North right now. He, he, the, the Spanish crown, um, grants him land and basically a fiefdom and he became a sovereign in quote the new world as a conquistador um and this is 1519 so that's where the 1519 project stems from where it where it emanates from that kind of history so this is a different kind of podcast about black people. It is a it is a project that is diasporic in nature and um blackness is a condition. And black dumb is a real place. <laughs> um Don't forget to buy a shirt. So I'm going to stand up now cuz I'm sitting and trying to be comfortable, but I want you to see the shirt cuz you need to buy one okay and then just go on the website and see it but <clears throat> so what is this podcast about 
Is it just about blackdom? Is it just about the Afro frontier? Um, I don't know. Sometimes it might be about current events uh, related to history, though. It's always going to be about the history. And black folks 100 years ago, generally speaking, and the black folks of 100 years ago, ain't no different than us now except they were better than us they were better than us in in so many different ways that we should just go ahead and lionize our ancestors even the ones that didn't do us proud because for most of our existence and let me just say most, because we're also talking here the 1519 Project, most of our existence on the North American, con- the so-called North American continent, there has been an opposition force um, that has uh, um, muted um, the colonizer within us or the sovereigns within us now sovereigns are not necessarily always colonizers but in this case they go together so as we get used to these terms black colonizers prince hall freemasons Military, so Buffalo soldiers in this case, because we're talking about the turn of the 20th century and the New Mexico Territory. Um, and ministers, we can easily put them in. I want you to understand the trajectory goes all the way back. Um, all the way back, 1500s, when the first wave invasion of indigenous lands started. With black folks at the tip of the spear, like Juan Garrido. That's what this is about. That us us um, bridging some gaps, because not all of us can go to college. Definitely, the vast majority of us can't afford it. I still can't afford it, and I went. Anyway, we'll get to that too. <laughs> um. In the meantime, yeah, go buy a shirt, um, buy a cup, um, because this shit is about to get legendary. I plan on learning how to do this right and making it worth your time because a lot of people competing for your time. I want to make sure that when you're in here in uh, the Black Renaissance, uh, you get a clear understanding of the, the history and um, how it relates to you right now and what you can get from it. It's kind of like uh, a minister in that way, in that, um, but only I'm a teacher, <laughs> not a minister. Um, like in the way the Bible doesn't get old, you can always go back. It's the same way that I treat uh, my dissertation. Not necessarily like it's a Bible, but it's the um, it brings me to core ideas that were never finished. My, my, dis- my dissertation was finished, but the ideas were never finished. And so the rest of this is an ongoing uh, development, um, the composting of it, um, the, the maturing of it. A lot of it is happening in real time and has been since 2015. Um What else? Um, We got about three more minutes for this 30-minute broadcast. Um, I can keep talking forever. I just want to make sure I covered all of these bases. So, to recap. Black ministers, military men, and Freemasons. And the inclusion 
at the intersection of that is black people, black folks. Oh, you think you're better than me? You think you're better than me? Good evening. Tonight, we go after the story of an extraordinary personality. He is Salvador Dali, the great surrealist painter, who sees the world through surrealist eyes. If you're curious to hear Salvador Dali talk about death, death and immortality, about his surrealist art, his confirmation, and his so known as Dan Paul, and that's the story of the Dutch one. Black nationalism, which means that the black man should control the politics of his own community and control the politicians who are in his own community. We must also realize that the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved we'll talk with Salvador without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. There's this myth that black people did not resist until Watts or until um, Malcolm or until the Black Panther Party. It's just not true. Uh, the, the, the first thing that the Black Panther Party did, of course, in Oakland was to patrol the community, uh, to set up an armed patrol in order to ensure that, that black people were not harassed and intimidated by uh, the local police department. But that had been done in the South. It was done in Birmingham. My father participated in armed patrols because they, they had to protect the community. They get out there. to recessed smoking because now Parliament with the recessed filter is best. The new Hi-Fi party. And here's why. First, Parliament is best because only Parliament can give you over 30,000 traps. No other popular cigarette delivers less nicotine and tar. Second, unlike ordinary filters, Parliament's filter is recessed, set deep down inside here, so that trapped nicotine and tar can't get on your lips. And third, because it's recessed, there's no bitter taste of trapped nicotine and tar to spoil Parliament's pure tobacco flavor. It's a clean, satisfying smoke. And remember, Parliament is continuously tested and reported by the United States Testing Company, one of the world's leading independent testing laboratories. Over 30,000 traps, exclusive recessed filter, flavor pure protection. Yes, smoke the best. High five Parliament, now at popular price. And now to our show.